You're watching BCTV. We're all about Brantford. You're watching BCTV, Brantford Government Television, a service of Brantford Community Television. This program is brought to you in part through the support of the Town of Brantford. So, okay, are we ready? Uh, Marcy will be joining shortly. Why don't we go ahead and get started, I guess. Uh, okay, great. Okay, we'll call this meeting of the Brantford Planning Zoning Commission. Recording in progress. Call the meeting to order. I have, it is uh, Thursday, March 16th, 2023. I have 7.09 p.m. Uh, I'll introduce members of commission and staff to begin with. Uh, Mr. Member Joe Chadwick, are you here? Joe Chadwick is present. Fred Russo, Fred, are you here? Fred Russo, present. Joe Vayuso, Joe, are you here? Joe Vayuso here. Uh, Massimo, Massimo Liguri, Massimo, are you here? Massimo, you're muted, I believe. All right, Massimo, you should be able to unmute yourself. Massimo Liguori is here, thank you. Okay. Great, thanks, Massimo. And I don't see Marcy yet, but uh, I think she'll be joining us soon. Uh, and I'm Chuck Anders Chair. Our staff this evening is our town planner, Harry Smith. Here, Harry, you're here? I'm here. And our system planner, Evan Brynan. Evan, you're here? Here. And our clerk recording secretary lurking in the cloud is Michelle Martin. Uh, do we have any notices of public hearing to read, Fred? Yes, we have uh, just one, actually. And if you'd like, I, I, I'll read it. Yes, please, Fred. Um, the Planning and Zoning Commission of the Town of Brantford, Connecticut, hereby gives notice of public hearings to be held on Thursday, March 16, 2023, at 8 p.m. by remote technology. Consider the applications listed below. Information regarding how to participate in the public hearings will be provided on the commission's meeting agenda that will be posted on the town's website at least 24 hours prior to the meeting. Number one, application number 23-2.1, special exception to convert the lower level into residential use located at 211 Montelee Street, Brantford Building Supplies, uh, uh, Brantford Building Supplies, in care of Vincent Giordano, applicant and owner. At said hearing, all persons will have the right to be heard. Copies are on file in the planning and zoning Commission office at the Planning and Zoning Department, 1019 Main Street, Brantford, Connecticut 06405. Written communications may be sent to the above address or to Planning and Zoning at Brantford uh, CT gov. Brantford Planning and Commission uh, and Zoning Commission, C. Andres Chairperson. That's it. Ah, Chuck Andres Chair, thank you for that. Um, I. Uh, before we get to our public hearings, we're going to go with our, our agenda items. And the first item on our agenda is a presentation by Desegregate Connecticut regarding a uh, public act. I believe it's, uh, or it's not public act, it's a raised bill, 6890, uh, an act concerning qualifying transit-oriented communities. Um, and um, I believe, it, uh, I think one, one thing before we go through the details. So we're going to defer on the process for public hearing and go through the rules after we go through this presentation. But one thing that we should do is when you speak, you're supposed, we're, we're supposed to say our names beforehand because some people uh, may be listening only and may not know who's speaking. That's why we should identify ourselves. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Harry, our town planner, Harry Smith, to introduce our speaker. Uh, Harry Smith, town planner. Um... We have a representative here from DCA Connecticut, uh, T.O. Hacks, if I pronounced that correctly. Um, so I'm just turn it right over to him. I know um, 
nothing about this channel, so I can't give you a bio or a little intro, but I'll let you introduce yourself. So take it away. I'm right. muted, Harry. Uh, he's all set. He's a co-host. He can help. Oh, okay. Thank you, though. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Smith, and to everyone on the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission here today. My name is Theo Hawks, and I'm a college student here in Connecticut, and I am um, an advocacy fellow with Work Live, or excuse me, with Desegregate Connecticut, and I'll be talking about our um, Work Live Ride policy proposal, also known as, uh, as Mr. Andres said, as House Bill 6890. Um, but for the for simplicity, we'll just be referring it to it as our work live ride proposal for the rest of this evening. Uh, so yes, I have some slides I'm really excited to present about this bill and how it might um, sort of, if it came to fruition, what it might look like here in Brantford. Um, so I have some slides and I'll share those, assuming I you said I was co-host, I should be able to. Yeah, you should be able screen. to share your screen. All right, let me just get the tab pulled up. Then I will go ahead and do that. Okay, let's see. Can everyone see that? Is, is that showing up all right? Yes. Uh, we can. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So, yes, uh, I've already gone over who I am. I'm speaking today about Work Live Ride, and let's get started. So a little bit of background first before we get started. Uh, it's um, kind of who who is Desegregate Connecticut? What do we believe in? Uh, simply put, we are a pro-homes coalition of neighbors and nonprofits. We have about, I think, 80 member groups of, um, or coalition members from other advocacy groups and nonprofits around the state of Connecticut. And we, at our core, believe that um, we believe in creating abundant and diverse communities and promoting economic prosperity, inclusivity, and environmental sustainability through land use and zoning measures. Uh, some more about our approach. We take in all of the above approaches. We um, advocate for all building more types of all, more, more of all different types of housing. We act within all different levels of government, state, local, and hopefully federal. Um, and we work in and with a diverse coalition that I, I mentioned as well. Um, this bill, as some of you may, if anyone's familiar with it already, um, is sort of centered around this concept of transit-oriented communities, which I, I'm sure some of you on the Planning Commission have already heard of, but just for anyone listening who doesn't have that background, transit-oriented communities sort of are this planning idea where you center riders of transit and pedestrians by building um, housing near transit infrastructure. And this sort of housing offers a diversity of home types and jobs and creates exciting and sustainable communities. So essentially building around transit. Uh, this concept is not new to Connecticut. It's been around for um, nearly 100 years, honestly. So as you can see, these are just a couple of snapshots from around the state where existing um, and historical transit lines are kind of the core of what knits a lot of these Connecticut towns together. And um, you, you'll you see sort of you know, throughout this, I think a, a bus down here in Hartford, a rail car in Waterbury, um, just sort of getting at the point that this transit-oriented development is, is really a part of New England character and um, Connecticut's history. Another note that's relevant here is that Connecticut is a transit rich state. We have 111 towns and cities served by local buses, rapid buses or trains with uh, 40 over 40 million annual rail rides and over 42 million annual bus rides. So lots of transit going on here in Connecticut. And just before we kick into the details of this bill, if anyone was familiar with our policy proposal from last season, um, we have definitely adjusted our course. We learned a lot from that process. And so just like speaking in broad strokes here, uh, a couple of our takeaways from the previous session was that mandates are not popular. Um, we're trying to avoid a one size fits all narrative. And we we definitely think that was, was true of our previous bill and hopefully um, can sort of as we'll talk about tonight's show how this new bill doesn't sort of fall into that same mistake. Uh, our previous legislation also didn't really 
take account and take buses into account, which is uh, was a huge uh, oversight since we we really um, see the critical role they play in a lot of communities here in Connecticut. And um, we were fo focusing previously mostly on, on rail lines. So including buses this time around and um, acknowledging that local capacity and infrastructure sometimes presents a barrier to transit oriented development. And we also believe that local planning commissions such as yours should be partners in implementing this bill and um, sort of realizing this vision. So. Without further ado, here's our Work Live Ride presentation for 2023. Um, work Live Ride is at its core, a vision for a more pros prosperous, equitable and sustainable state. It's a policy framework to align local and state planning goals and it's a call to action to be the change that we want to see in our communities. Uh, the ACT framework is sort of broken down as follows. Essentially, a town or city planning and zoning commission opts into the bill or to the policy framework by creating a transit oriented community district along a bus or rail route. Um, the Office of Responsible Growth or OG partners with the PNZ on the design of this um, transit oriented district and its implementation, providing support throughout the entire process. And ORG would direct discretionary state funding for planning and design of this uh, <clears throat> district for infrastructure improvements within it and uh, for the home creation within that district. Um, so this is sort of breaking that down in a different way here. The um, steps to sort of implementing these districts sort of come in three phases. The first is the planning and design phase where um, the, the local planning and zoning commission would sort of partner with ORG and try to identify an, uh, an appropriate location and size of the transit oriented district and um, also identifying the necessary, any sort of studies or planning changes that would have to take place. And um, this, this is also the part of the, the process where funding would be approved. And then the second stage is infrastructure improvements surrounding that area. So I, once again, identifying um, ways to make this development more more feasible within the identified district and this is where the office of responsible growth would coordinate and expedite existing state discretionary funding for the related projects to flushing out this infrastructure and third the final home creation within that district uh, would be where the um, the state and local pnz would sort of work together to identify potential projects with affordable housing. And um, this would also be a, a spot where the those two entities would work together to sort of implement this housing growth within that district. Um, as far as sort of the breakdown of Connecticut, uh, this is again where I sort of said we tried to avoid a one size all fits one size fits all approach this time around. So we've sort of broken down the different towns and cities in Connecticut into three categories. The first is a transit adjacent community. So this is a town or a city that's bordering one of the other two groups, uh, but might not have its own transit. A transit community is a town or city with at least one local bus route. And a rapid transit community is a town or city with at least one rail or rapid bus station. And then we would then take these, or the, the Work Live Ride proposal kind of allocates various densities and um, sort of housing requirements within these districts based on the type of community that uh, each, each town would sort of fall into the, the type of uh, transit sort of designation, I guess, that, that each town would fall into. And that designation would determine each um, transit oriented development districts, housing density. So that's that's a breakdown of how that would work. Branford specifically is a rapid transit community with two bus lines in a population of under 60,000. Um, this would mean that within the work live ride framework, the transit oriented development district would have to be about um, 20 homes per acre. Now that would sort of be the density requirement, but Branford's planning and zoning zoning committee would determine the location and size of this district. So um, whether it's 
you know, half an acre or three acres would be sort of up to um, the PNZ and ORG to work together to sort of arrive at the most logical and um, effective district size for, for this community. Um, so, uh, and yeah, just in that process, the ORG would um, work once again to identify funding sources for any ne necessary infrastructure improvements within these districts. Um, some sort of examples of what 20 homes per acre can look like. This is 20 homes per acre in a more residential settings. As you can see, it's sort of the town townhouse type of development with multiple uh, units and these sort of lined up on in a typical suburban setting. But this this density can look a lot of different ways. And again, would be um, up to the PNZ to decide where and what what that looks like. Uh, a few of the requirements for these TOC districts uh, would be that they must be a reasonable size and near to a transit station. They would be um, they would have to include as of right development of mixed use mixed income housing. They would also have to include affordability levels based on state housing uh, state housing needs assessments. Uh, I can include some information about that on a later slide. And they must not include any parking requirements, lot size minimums, or residency restrictions. This is the sort of breakdown of opportunity level and market activity, which would determine uh, the level of affordability required within the uh, district. And this sort of depends, varies by town. Uh, I can circle back, oops, to this. Oh, sorry about that. At, at the end, if we're wondering um, what percentage that would be based on the housing report, but um, I believe Brantford falls within this this high opportunity but weak market activity, which would uh, lead it to be about like an eighteen percent affordable um, requirement. But I will double check that at the end because I'm sure that's something y'all are wondering about. Um, but moving on to what would happen if a community doesn't choose to opt in, if a town or city doesn't opt in, they would become ineligible for certain discretionary state funding tied to infrastructure. Um, similarly, if a town opts in but doesn't create a TOC district, they would have to re reimburse any planning and um, funding or any of these grants received uh, that they, they were only getting to support the TOC. So basically, if they said that if a town said that they were going to create a transit oriented community district and then didn't, they, they would just have to yeah, pay back any money that they did receive for that. And a town or city could not retroactively reduce density in a district or else they would face penalties. Um, so a big question we've got with this is which discretionary funds would be relevant here? And it's, it's not all distress, discretionary funding. It's not even all discretionary funding. Uh, tied up in infrastructure or any of these um, individual categories. But here are a few of the, um, or a, a list of the grants that we are considering for this, um, for this program. This might not be final. This is still sort of a, a point of the program that's still in flux, but generally um, these funds would fall into three, bu three buckets the Brownfield Remediation Grants, the Revitalization Grants, and the Transit Oriented Development Grants. And as you can see, there's a list of some of these grants within each of those buckets. Um, this bill is also really critical in that it plans to expand the Office of Responsible Growth. This expansion would provide funding for four full-time land use planners and would sort of also um, include additional funding for existing programs to serve as a top-up fund. Some of these programs could use a little bit more support and we would hope that expanding the um, office would uh, create an opportunity to provide that support. Uh, the office would also have statutory authority to determine town and city uh, TOC compliance. So they would be you know, allowed to set guidelines for uh, these districts, and they would also have statutory authority to coordinate other state agencies providing the relevant discretionary funding. So some of those funds that I mentioned earlier are coming from a variety of different um, state agencies and departments, and they would have the ability to kind of be the, the lead coordinator of all that. Uh, and then finally, the Office of Responsible Growth would have the authority to establish um, TOC district guidelines and public resources on data and planning best practices. Um, 
as we're wrapping up here, I'll just sort of highlight where we are in this legislative process. Uh, as we mentioned, this work live ride is House Bill 6890. Uh, we just had our Planning and Development Committee public hearing uh, just yesterday. It went very long, but it was it was very productive. It seemed like there were a lot of um, there's more supportive the testimony than against, uh, but all of that will sort of come to its its head in the PND committee um, vote, which will be coming soon. Uh, Work Live Ride is also sort of earmarked in Governor Lamont's, Lamont's budget proposal for this session, and much of this sort of same ideas and um, philosophies that we've been advocating, advoc excuse me, advocating for within this bill are reflected and echoed in Majority Leader Rojas's housing bill. Uh, that leads me to the end of the presentation, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen, but I'll be taking notes uh, on anything you guys are wondering about, and um, I'm happy to answer questions if I can. So thank you very much. Chuck, can just share? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hawks. Uh, let's open it up for any questions from commission members or staff. Um, maybe I'll start with a question. Yeah, I think you said that one of the requirements is that the if the commission opts in and you know creates a zone that it couldn't require parking was that correct so within that zone um it would we've i think i may have misspoke a little bit um the the zone itself is sort of designed to be focused on transit so people who are living in this new development are are typically going to be more reliant on the public transportation options that it's built around uh, that being said, there would be, I, th I think there's there's the actual um, bill's language is that it would prevent developers from building excessive uh, parking space. So it, it wouldn't, um, there wouldn't be like a hard and fast like limit on like no parking space at all. But there would, it would just basically the idea is to incentivize a more conscious use of um land around these transit districts specifically because of the environmental concerns of um, increasing impervious surfaces and also just this sort of idea that you know people living in these um, this new development would be more likely to use um, public transit so I don't it's it's not that these the new development could not have any parking so sorry if I, if I wasn't clear about that well maybe follow up on that Harry Smith town planner um you know I've went to planning school many, many decades ago. <laughs> and we've been talking about this kind of thing for an awfully long time. Sure. Um, but given the existing level of service, so we're not in the Metro North line. So the Shoreline East rapid transit commuter line, whatever you want to call it, has pretty limited service. And given the already existing kind of dispersed development pattern and location of of uh, employment centers and whatnot, um, you know, there's a certain group of people that could commute from Branford to jobs in New Haven, um, which I think probably already taking that option, depending on, you know, the gasoline price versus whatever, you know, sure. the dynamic that keeps going on. But I, personally, I would see this sort of as an evolving thing where, you know, maybe in the beginning, as you're starting it, you allow more parking than you may want to have. And then as time goes on, maybe you tighten it up once you sort of measure how many people are actually given the increased development, actually, you know, uh, increasing transit use and there's actually is more service provided, you know, come back off of that, provide some development opportunities where parking currently exists or something like that. Um, but it, it seems like going from zero to 60 all at once may be kind of problematic for development that's constructed and doesn't have adequate parking to deal with the way, you know, land use currently exists and people currently commute to their employment centers and everything else. Sure. Right. And I think, again, that's, that's where that flexible language of uh, the sort of prevention of excessive parking, but I think that's deliberately flexible to allow for um, kind of the interplay of what each specific town needs because Brantford is in a very different position, <laughs> how much parking needs than um, somewhere like, Stanford. Uh, Stanford, exactly. <laughs> yeah, there, it's it's very different. So the the idea is that there's some flexibility built in there, um, uh, and that's left up to the these. state responsible growth coordinator. Is that how that is set up? 
so I the, that person. the the the, <laughs> the um the idea is that these this coordinator and this team of at the sort of expanded org would be working with um the towns each town's planning and zoning commission to make some of these decisions but yeah i think the the idea that you highlighted that this should be evolving and kind of adapting is is hopefully um something that we can get through here okay hey, uh th thank you mr hacks other questions from commission members for uh, mr hacks let, let, let me ask uh I'll have one. Oh, no, go ahead. Sorry. Well, no, I, I, I had sort of a question. I mean, during the POCD, we spent an awful lot of time uh, discussing transit-oriented development. Mm -hmm. um, I like trains. I live near the train. I have a fairly high tolerance for the sound of trains. Many people don't, especially if you live really, really close to a train. And then there's the metaphor and the optics of living on the other side of the tracks. Um, I don't know if that um, sort of pastiche is going to be applied to these developments. Um, I, I know there was, you know, from, from my time on the housing authority, there were significant social justice problems with locating certain kinds of housing in certain locations. So that has me a little itchy about all this. I, I, I don't think there's there's been sort of the depth and breadth of practical t um, thought involved in this as much as the, the sort of aspirational um, kind of things. And yeah, you know, while I fully support the aspirational stuff, um, the implementation just has me a little spooked. Um, this this office of you know sort of general housing good guy or good person, um, it sounds great in theory. This is politics, and we have no idea how that is going to morph into something else. And I sped read through the bill that Harry sent today, so I'll, I'll apologize for not having a whole lot of depth in my my understanding of it. But um, um, there, there, there's sort of there is a thinness to it that invites trouble from a procedural standpoint. And I'm sure once the bill is passed, other people make procedures. But um, I, I, I kind of think this needs to go back in the oven a little longer. Sure. So just responding to a couple of the things that you brought up. I'm also a, a big fan of trains, so uh, I'm glad we share that. And I, I do know that not everyone loves living next to them. I think what the beauty of this bill is that it also accommodates bus lines. So I think if that was a major concern in a given community, um, there can totally be adjustments and um, kind of prioritization of developing around or uh, around or near existing bus transit, which doesn't typically have the same noise um, challenges that that trains sometimes can have. Um, as for you're right that this this bill is not in its its final iteration, and you know there there's still steps to be taken along with this legislative process. So um, I, I hear you there, and I think that this, the final thing about the, the ORG office is that um, it currently, it, it has existed since I think 2007. So it's it's not new necessarily. And it's it's not kind of this this big unknown that it, it may sound like it's, I think just kind of expanding an existing, um, existing position and giving that office a little bit more resources to, to assist in some of this development um, at the local level. So I think that's just something I'd like to clear up as well. Uh, happy to take other questions. I'll, I'll, I have uh, one, one more. I, 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 I think you started, you know, comparing with last year's bill, which I had heard about, but I didn't really know that much that just sure. the, the idea, this is more incentive based as opposed to mandating something that this is if you do this, you you'll receive funding, mm -hmm. uh, and opportunities for funding, which is you know I certainly uh, like that better. <laughs> um, but the question I, I was kind of wondering about is is the funding that and, and I don't know if the bill specifies the funding. So you gave three examples, which were I I don't know if they're in the bill or, or ideas or thoughts that it would be. 
but my question was is is the funding that that would be the subject of this bill this infrastructure funding is, is that now open to all and then if this bill were adopted would it only be open to those who have opted in and you know adopted the zone and or whatever so that that's my question sure yeah that's that's another point um that i'm, I'm really glad you asked about so the discretionary funding situation is that um, currently, the bill gives us these sort of subject areas of where we're looking at discretionary funding. I um, sort of outlined those three buckets, but the specific grants um, that would be in or out of the eligibility requirements um, are still sort of in the works. So not there's not a complete list of what um, a town would be ineligible or eligible for based on their, their opt-in, opt-out status yet. But the, the idea is that... Um, you know, if you're not building transit oriented districts, it doesn't make sense for a town to make to be eligible for transit oriented district funding. So I guess that's that's kind of the idea with it there. But in um, in answer to your question there. Oh, there's one more thing I wanted to say. Um, you were wondering about, oh, if it's if these grants are currently open to everyone. So a lot of these example grants, again, like not official list, but a lot of the examples we've been looking at are currently competitive. So it's there, um, certain, certain, of, certain grants are, have eligibility requirements already and certain grants are open to everyone, but then are kind of a, based on a competitive application process uh, that is determined in um, each funds, each grants the corresponding state agency. So it's it's not necessarily new to sort of um, have an idea where certain eligibility requirements would determine whether a, a town receives funding. Um, so again, it's, it's hard to answer that definitively without a list of each and every specific grant. But in general, I think um, it might be making some things more competitive, but in like a lot of these these grants um, do have certain requirements already. Well, let me, can I maybe file that up a little bit? Harrison, sure. Town Planner. I mean, you did li li um, list steep grants sort of categorically, which are small town economic assistance program grants, right. which Branford has uh, applied for and received several of. And um, it sounds like that, at least the way it seems to be envisioned now would be hooked into this process. So if Branford chose not to opt in, it possibly would no longer qualify for any steep funding is what I'm getting at. It's possibly depending on how it finalizes rather than just the steep grant that might address the area around the train station, for example, or something sure. you know, arguably within the transit district. So it seems like it's a little, um, in that sense, potentially less carrot, more stick. Um, depending on how far and wide the net is cast and what discretionary funding sources the town might be excluded from should it choose not to participate. Yeah, so uh, that's that's definitely a um, concern we've heard from other smaller towns as well is the, the steep grant has been is really helpful for a lot of people. And yes. um, we're not sure exactly how that'll shake out in the end, but ultimately the, the purpose of this discretionary funding sort of mechanism so to speak, is is it's supposed to be an incentive. So we do want to kind of incentivize towns to adopt these this sort of more sustainable, equitable, affordable planning and development. And um, if this discretionary models is something that can hopefully spur that type of development, we'd, we'd like to see it. Um, but I again, I think this the list of grants isn't final yet. And I think it would it would take some coordination hopefully by the, the ORG office in, in um, conjunction with existing town planning commissions to sort of figure out the right, the right um, grants to include or exclude in this, in this process. Yeah, I mean, I think that more goes to the, back to Joe's point about this not being completely baked maybe. Um, but let me ask one more question. We have um, sort of how our uh, thinking of our, the area around the train station has evolved to my understanding is that, um, um, recognizing that we had like several towns along the rail line had a lot of the area along the rail line zoned industrial. 
we had a large two or three fail, uh, factory industrial complexes that uh, became defunct. Um, one fairly large one um, was repurposed as a planned development district. This is prior to our TOD study. Mm -hmm. So frankly, we had approved already before that two pretty large scale uh, planned development districts, um, mixed use, much housing. Um, one will have um, probably about at least 150 units of multifamily and the other one's planned for 200 uh, units of multifamily all within, I think the second one is still within a, a quarter mile of the train station, certainly sure. within a half mile. Um, so how does that factor in these existing plan development districts? I mean, we were probably on our own thinking, not going to necessarily have them in a transit oriented development district per se. Um, so if they, because of, you know, they're basically historic, they probably will qualify for the density, but we couldn't retroactively apply the affordable housing characteristics to, uh, to them or those requirements. How that all plays out, I mean, we certainly would want to be recognized for the fact that we, as a community and as a planning zoning commission, um, propose the approval of these things, which are serving the purpose, I think, of what's intended by the legislation as far as they could back then. Um, one of them is donating some money to you know housing trust fund, uh, the second one, but um, they're not gonna meet the affordable housing provisions in this. So how that plays out would be of concern, I think the branch. Sure, yeah, I, I think there is existing language in the bill to kind of accommodate um, towns who have already created TODs. Um, well, this isn't a per se a TOD, so it might sure, be sure. not in the box you've already created. It might need to be a more creative box. To sure. Box. So, uh, just my my point in bringing that up was just yeah, yeah. saying that there there is some <clears> level of, <throat> like wiggle room, as it were, for for existing dense housing. The the sort of premise is kind of proximity to transit because we we um, have you know, done our research and seen that that is, is really important for equitable development and affordability and all these things that we care about. So I think the, it would have to be kind of looked at in your specific context, like how, how close is this existing development to um, like transit and whether it's the rail line or, or buses and kind of making those, those decisions. And again, affordability is, is a part of the goal as well here. So um, I'm not sure if those would be opted or it's sort of like grandfathered in as it were, but um, it's, it's technically possible, but I'm, I'm just, I'm not exactly sure um, how close all of these things are to. Are to yeah. Yeah. And we only have so much area that has not been, you know, that, that wasn't developed industrially and then it's surrounded by historic housing, which sure. the community may not want to see, you know, it designated into an area that would allow, redevelopment at 18 dwelling units an acre, where right now, you know, maybe only four or five are possible. And that's the way it's built out. Sure. And should the rezoning happen, then you create a, a you know, a huge potential uh, for someone to come in and come in and buy out these, you know, the historic fabric of the community, essentially, and start redeveloping it, which in certain parts might be, you know, I don't know what the community would want to do, but Certainly, may not want to see that happen. Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> Chuck Andrews here. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Hacks and Harry. Any further questions or comments from commission members or staff? Chuck Fred Russo. I just like to uh, make a point. I guess um, that I, I, in principle, I have um, misgivings about any bill that is going to hand out money, you know, through a grant or whatever. On one hand and penalize a, a town for not joining at that particular time, or they're not allowed to participate in, in those things. Kind of a little bit playing off of what Harry said. Um, I, I, I'm skeptical that um, there's just not, one, there's just not enough information tonight to even consider anything. I, I do appreciate all the comments that were made um, here tonight, but I, I don't see there's enough information um, that's been presented that would would make our commission one way or the other decide. I, I think more information should be brought forward 
um, with this. I, I know, it is, I'm not sure other um, members of the commission received an email. There's, a, I think, an opposition group to this um, to this bill. I didn't really get to read it. Just kind of glanced over it. But uh, I, I like to, would like to read that too, and it, you know, make some comparisons. I, I think everybody has a right to present their case in the best way they can, and and often maybe not present certain things that are not uh, as attractive. But um, my main concern is that when when, uh, when especially when the state gets involved, it scares me quite honestly. I, I love the fact that we have autonomy as a board, and I, what I would never want to see is it eroded by weight you know, oh, waggering money in front of us and saying, you know, you do this, you're going to get money. But if you know, you're going to be out. And and so I, I think we should be cautious about a plan like this. That's my comment. Chuck Anders chair. Thank you, Fred. Uh, other comments, questions from any commission members or staff? Hey, none, Mr. Hax, you got anything you, you want to leave us with? or uh, No, that's everything I have. Thank you guys so much. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to okay. speak with you all. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Yep. Thank you. Have thank a good you rest of your night. Yep. Take care. With that, then, we'll move to our public hearings. And uh, I'll say what the rules are for our normal public hearing process, which is that the applicant goes first makes his presentation. Uh, Evan and Harry can assist with screen sharing or anything else you need. Uh, after the applicant goes, then we turn it over to the commission and staff. We may have a staff report summary and questions, comments from the commission. And then we op at that point, we'll open up to the public. And we ask you to identify yourself. I'm gonna ask Evan to review the public process for our Zoom public participation. After the public portion is done, the applicant's allowed to respond to any public portion. And uh, we may or may not close the public hearing. It's not unusual to continue public hearings over one or more meetings. With that, Evan, can you review the process for the public to participate in the public hearings? Uh, sure, down at the bottom of your screen, uh, there's a reactions button. You, once you select that, there's a second, second option uh, to raise hand. Uh, please do that if you'd like to participate during the public hearing. You can also write into the chat that you'd like to participate. Uh, and if you've called in, you can press star nine to raise your hand to indicate that you'd like to speak. And we ask that everybody please identify themselves uh, before they ask any questions or make any comments. Chuck Anders, Chair. Thank you, Evan. With that, we'll proceed to our public hearings. Items number one through four are continued public hearings. This is BC Investment Properties, LLC, 175 Cherry Hill Road. It's the 11 lot resubdivision. Uh, two special exception applications for interior rear lots, as well as a special exception for grading. And uh, we had previously uh, had a couple of evenings of public hearing on this and it's been continued. Uh, is the applicant here on this, Mr. Georgina? I see you're muted right now, but uh, I guess we they'll make you a co-host and you can chime in. Okay, can we all hear me now? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Uh, so as this is uh, a fairly repeat, I'm gonna try and keep this short and sweet and just address the uh, the high points here. Uh, let's see, I should have screen share. We want to share screen three. And can we all see the map? I decided to stick with uh, the PDF. That'll be the same uh, black and white versus white and black color. So no confusion tonight. tonight. Uh, yes, we can see it. It's in white with black text. Awesome. It should look exactly like the print that you guys have. Yes. <laughs> um, awesome. So uh, as we are aware, uh, we are looking to resubdivide this lot at 175 Cherry. Oh, sorry. My name is Zach Georgia. I'm with Giuliano Associates, uh, located at 405 Bain Street in Wallingford. I will be representing the application. Um, so as we are aware, uh, we are looking to resubdivide the 12.4 acre lot at the end of Cherry Hill Road, uh, number 175 Cherry Hill Road. Uh, currently, it is farmland that has been fairly uh, unmaintained for the last 20 years. Uh, there's currently a 
house in disrepair on it uh, and several structures that are in various states of falling down uh, from, from just being abandoned. What we are looking to do is add an extension to the end of Cherry Hill Road and subdivide this lot into 11 smaller lots featuring two rear lots, a area of open space along the west of the property that will be uh, granted to the regional water authority and connect up on Autumn Ridge Road between number 14 and 16 Autumn Ridge Road. Uh, we can hang out here for a bit. Uh, as you know, when we left off on our last uh, portion of the public meeting uh, due to just delays in you know, pr producing uh, revisions and receiving comments and giving comments and back and forth, uh, there was a revision in front of the commission and town staff that it had limited time to review. Uh, as such, we offered to push this off until we could get a uh, final or more complete review out of town staff that has uh, been received. Um, and there was actually, Harry, or, we're, we're good with the 520 revision that was sent out today. Uh, Harry Smith Town Planner 520 revision. Yeah, the time you sent it. Oh, oh well, the uh, yes, I'll present them to the commission when I start speaking. Okay, so, I, I, I was going to go into it, so I just wanted to make sure that 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 you they, they haven't seen that copy yet. I just sent that to you, so you would have seen it before the meeting. Okay. Um, in that case, if Harry is going to go over that, I know it's a little outside of this. Harry, would you be willing to present that? And I can just address a couple of comments uh, as presented. Because that's really what we were waiting for last time was yeah. um, addressing that. Uh, if that's fine with the chair, that's fine with me. That's fine. Okay. Um, so I can take that up now, I guess. Um, uh, Zach, if you could uh, stop Absolutely. sharing temporarily. and um, I'll share again. My name is Harry Smith, town planner. Um, okay, should be able to see. I guess I'm going to start though with um, this. So it just was a hanging loose end, as alluded to a couple of minutes ago. Uh, the fire marshal had not yet responded in terms of commenting on the last revised plan set that was submitted by the applicants team. Um, so he has now done that with a, a letter dated the 8th, it's basically briefly saying the proposal for the property development meets fire safety standards without impact firefighting feasibility for the branch fire department. So that loose ends nailed down. Um, today we did receive, um, I received an email uh, from the town engineer, which I believe I forwarded to the commission. This was yesterday, excuse me. Uh, raising concerns about the condition of Cherry Hill Road from an engineering viewpoint. Um, so um, I'll just point out this three main concerns he has. Um, one is uh, he wants to go through the process of establishing a weight limit for two culverts uh, that pass under Cherry Hill Road um, to determine what level of construction traffic, what weight of vehicle could safely pass over those culverts. Um, he believes there's a definite possibility there may be weight restrictions um, on that, um, those two culvert areas. Um, he also raises a question about the potential uh, width of um, the existing roadway north of Avon, which is a side road that comes off of Cherry Hill Road where the, the road condition deteriorates north of that. Um, that that possibly not being wide enough for tracks, a certain size truck, typically a, uh, the type of truck that would be taking uh, earth material out of the site. It's about 18,000 cubic yards of material. It's fine to stay in these, be removed from the property. Um, there would be in vehicles of that type being removed. So he thinks though with proper staging traffic control, it should be able to coordinate trucks through the narrow sections. He also raises the concern about um, the roadway structure is probably not going to stand up very well to heavy truck traffic. Um, and as such, he expects the deterioration of the quality of Cherry Hill Road north of Avon, such as it is. Um, so those are the concerns raised. Um, in a minute, I'll get to a proposal to sort of parse these out. Um, 
I think certainly the safety concern for truck traffic that's related to the construction of the site, taking earth material off the property is the primary concern uh, that the commission probably should be addressing um, if it feels it wants to approve this development. Um, it too seems to be addressable with some coordination and a concrete proposal acceptable to the engineering department. And three is, well, the road is what it is now. It's probably gonna deteriorate with more traffic period. And uh, the truck traffic is probably gonna exacerbate that deterioration. But is that anything to do with the applicant or is that more of something that's re that the town should be responsible for in terms of, of uh, it's its road and it's public road and you'll need to maintain it. Um, so there's that. Um, I might go at this point right into, um, I've revised um, two of the three uh, staff recommendation memos. So there is one for the subdivision, which is in front of you now. And there is one for the interior lot special exceptions for lots two and five, which is as it was um, sent in the packet last Friday. So I haven't edited that at all. And then there is a fourth application for special exception for grading. I've revised that also. So just to go through some revisions, I sent a couple of first level revisions out last night. I further revised it today and changes from the one you got in the email last night are in yellow. So I'll start from that premise and just sort of run through this. If anybody has any questions, feel free to jump right in as I'm going through this. Um, so this is for the subdivision itself, the resubdivision technically. Um, there was a question about street trees and we had some discussion, I think at the last public hearing about should it be one species, two species. Uh, we've also gotten some input that I put in the application file from um, the Community Forest Commission and one of their representatives recommending um, a couple of different tree species at least. The applicant's certainly willing to do that. Um, and there is a list of native trees that they have submitted into the record also. I'll just switch over if I can here. You should be able to see this list. In. Um, so there's quite a number of species. Um, when I, this condition here, excuse me, um, would require that the tree species selected, and there should be two as it's recommending, um, would be both town tree warden approved and on that list I just flashed in front of the commission. So we wanna make sure it's approved by the town tree warden. And if the applicant's willing, it sounds like they are, to look at limiting the selection to those native trees that the Community Forest Commission has identified. Um, this section here, um, notes that are required by this particular portion of the subdivision regulations um, with respect to um, declaring that the offer of open space land and other easements indicated on the plans um, it basically puts the applicant on the hook for that. So some language that should be added to the plans from that section. Um, see that's highlighted here um, and this is required anyway by the subdivision regulations but just in terms of making sure everything's clear. Um, just notes the provisions of section 6.02C, which is the section about requiring a financial guarantee, the plans that have been posed to the applicant. Um, note that they will need to post the financial guarantee acceptable to um, the commission pursuant to the subdivision regulations before they get the mylar signed and filed in the land records. Um, I did provide here the last part of the sentence, the exclusion of using a surety bond. Commission is not required legally to um, accept the surety bond in my experience, this can be very difficult to collect. Um, so, and I think in other developments, approvals have excluded the use of those. Um, this is a condition we just had, just in case they relocate driveways for some reason through another adjoining property. Right now, all the driveways and the plans are shown to be on the individual properties, including the interior lots. Um, but if they want to do something different, they have to come back in and get. Um, approval of a modification. 
and that's that section 6.10 is for modifications approved subdivision plans. Um, e has to do with the open space, making sure we get an executed deed, transferring that to them, a form of content acceptable to town council, myself, uh, providing for public access and permanent protections, open space, and meeting all the other requirements and subdivision regulations. Um, F we used, I think, in the Buckley Road development. Um, so there were, certainly is um, the possibility the Regional Water Authority may not take this for some reason. Um, if that's the case, um, there would need to be the provision of, uh, by the applicant, a proposal for an alternative disposition of the open space. I think they've mentioned previously possibly a homeowners association. If it is a homeowners association, it'd be a quite a bit of additional information needed. So this outlines all of that. Um, G, are just again, reiterating requirements already in the uh, subdivision regulations for um, paper copies and a mile R once it's all ready to go. Um, H, I have added in, um, and we'll just flip to the plan set quickly. Right here, these two lots currently have driveways that come through the town right of way. It's a little stub right of way that was left when Autumn Ridge was developed and accepted as a town road. Um, those driveways would need to be reworked a bit. Um, this proposes to take this driveway here and turn it to exit onto Autumn Ridge as far as I understand it. It looks like that distance is too close to the intersection to meet the requirements of the zoning regs. Zach, you have a question? Uh, just, just to clarify, you, that is correct. Uh, and that distance is 25 feet per the regulation. Is it? Okay. As yep. long as it meets it, that's fine. Um, it seemed to be closer to me, but regardless, um, I think there needs to be a more detailed design for that. Um, that hasn't been finalized is my understanding. So going back to So it basically says there'll be final configuration changes, conformance to zoning regulations proposed on the relevant plan sheet. So that's indicated exactly how they're going to be built and done. Um, number three, um, just requires storm drainage system to be determined at the time of final house design. Um, you know, these footprints may change. There's proposals for roofing drains being tied into the storm drainage system, I believe. And um, um, uh, roof drainage coming out and dispersing through a basically just being dispersed onto the property of the individual house lots right uh it it does vary um to to meet the storm water you can't hear me i just didn't let up green uh just to meet the storm water requirements some of them are proposed to uh tie into the system that that volume is accounted for based on the uh the footprint designed uh and then others are designed to go into on uh, individual um, detention systems that would infiltrate water into the uh, uh, the groundwater. Uh, I believe there are also a couple that do daylight directly onto uh, the grass to be treated by swale. But uh, again, it's designed okay. to be uh, roof water, which is assumed clean. It shouldn't need treatment. Yeah. Okay. Um, for a response to a comment we've had raised previously by the uh, Regional Water Authority, this is at the edge of the watershed of Lake Saltonstall, public drinking water source. Um, and uh, this is a recommendation on the Regional Water Authority um, just to limit um, uh, fuel tank storage on the ground and um, that uh, associated piping the basement segregated for floor drains. So that's not going, you know, it's not being cold mingled and being discharged in the environment. Um, five, um, we just required final erosion control plans, again, um, approved by CEO, town planner, underground utilities being required, that's standard in the regulations. Again, all lots connected to the town sewer system that's already been approved, so that would need to be finalized. I had proposed a sewer, sanitary sewer easement for private laterals. Um, this was really a condition we had in another development that was related to um, sewer connections crossing other properties. So the uh, uh, town engineering department wanted to be assured that there was an easement to provide for that if that connection was not gonna be straight from a lot to the public sewer system. Um, eight is typical condition um, requiring um, trees be planted, um, possibly outside of the right of way. 
if necessary. There are no overhead utility lines here, so it's not really the case. Um, and um, so just if it doesn't fit in the right of way, there's a possibility outline how to do it, to plant them outside of the right of way within an easement, and that easement would contain an obligation to the property owner not to prune, remove or replace the tree without permission of the town. Um, and this is a one year uh, tree, street tree, basically survival um, requirement, part of bond uh, for that. Um, and I just edited it just a little bit. And that is it for the subdivision. Um, it, before, I was gonna say, before we hop on Harry, if I just make comment directly, uh, these sure. as revised are um, uh, fine. Most of these would be addressed with uh, notes on the subdivision sheet or uh, various changes as as, as needed. Uh, again, we're we're fine with all of these. Okay. Uh, moving on to the interior rear lots. Um, this is identical to the one that was in the packet that went out last Friday. Uh, lot five. If let's see, I'll put this up here just quickly so everyone remembers. Lot five is this lot here, and lot two is this one here. Lot two bumps up against this long, elongated lot that fronts on Autumn Ridge Road, which is already developed. This is all somebody's backyard, basically. Um, lot five is interior and has a little corner that intrudes into the steep slope area that we've the uh, I've talked to the applicant about throwing an easement on here in this steep slope corner of it. They're fine with that, I believe. Um, so just to go back, pretty straightforward, finding compliance with... Um, the normally applicable section uh, requirements of section 6.3 landscaping um, for excellence in landscaping design. It's the only way you can do it. Um, as discussed last meeting, um, let me go back quickly. Um, actually, this one's better. So this is a brand new lot, brand new lot, brand new lot surrounded by them. Uh, to me, it makes no sense to start planting things here not knowing what's going to happen on this lot. Everyone's starting from scratch. Uh, it just didn't make any sense to require that. Usually those requirements are for when you're subdividing something, let's say this was one house lot, all the other lots were developed and you're adding a potential house location where there never was a house before and you want to protect a bunch of properties from uh, any intrusion from that new house. So this is totally different. So. That's why I propose that. Um, and also waiving the requirement for a landscape plan by a landscape architect, technically we're waiving that. Um, prior to start construction, erosion control measures in place, typical condition. Um, a couple of things to be done before uh, issuance of a zoning permit are listed here. One is identifying any significant trees. I, there may be a couple on lot five. Some of these lots are fairly clear. Some of these lots are in areas where there's a little bit of of either um, trees that were part of the farm or some things that have grown up in the intervening 20 years from um, the property really being utilized well. Um, I'm putting B here in italics, um, that would um, require reconsideration of low impact development practices for the roof leaders, the footing drains and the sump pumps. Um, you know, right now, some of them, as we mentioned a minute ago, are directed into the stormwater drainage system. Um, this is just to consider it doesn't require anything in particular, just sort of a relook and consideration. Uh, I think um, ideally with a town engineer, um, we do have some regulatory requirements to make sure these things are considered when we um, have our own discharge, stormwater discharge permit as a municipality reviewed by the state. So. That's one reason for throwing this in. Uh, three is a standard lighting condition, just throw in here. Uh, dust control uh, requirement if determined necessary from the zoning enforcement officer, pretty standard. Um, again, this is from previous comment from the Regional Water Authority about um, having fuel oil tanks above ground, um, separating floor and them being separated from floor drains and sump pumps. Um, and then a last condition here about voiding the approval if the subdivision for some reason doesn't go ahead. Uh, very similar lot two, the only difference here, it's almost identical, 
is a requirement for a, a landscape planting strip, which is required normally by the regulations. I'll go back and show you this area. Um, it's already, well, there's nothing on the plan yet, but this is a situation where without the interior lot requirement, there may not be a house here depending on how they laid it out. So this provides some protection for this property owner from any detrimental visual impact of this house just to create a buffer. There, this is sort of overdrawn a little bit as I think it's been cleared pretty much to the property line and the existing vegetated area here is really skimpy thin and pretty, pretty narrow as well. Um, I was out there a couple of weeks ago and it's not a lot to it. So this could be bumped up. If there's anything vegetation that could really be used out here that could be added to the plan and given consideration. Um, so that is it. Everything else is identical. Um, and then lastly is the recommendation for the uh, section 6.8 grading approval. Uh, Harry, if I may, just before we oh, go right on again. Yep. Um, Zach, George, and I from Giuliano Associates again. Uh, again, no issues with these, and we are completely open uh, with the final to put the 10-foot buffer, as Harry requested, um, for that lot, uh, for lot two. All right, great. Um, so section 6.8, um, this is where we, let's just go into it. it the um, comments of the town engineer on Cherry Hill Road. Um, right now, there is a note on the plan that I believe mandates use of Cherry Hill Road for the construction traffic, particularly the removal of the excess um, earth material. Um, so I'm not sure if the applicant wants to modify that because at this point, um, there's some concern about the safety of using Cherry Hill Road for vehicles that would be involved in the removal of that earth material. Um, so I provided a place here for the plans to basically be revised by the applicant if they do that <laughs> after I'm done talking. Um, otherwise, it's just a typical condition for any of the approved plans. Um, these are typical things that would need to be done before construction activity, so on erosion control bond. Um, addition of a note saying you can't remove topsoil without, uh, this is again a required note listed in the regulations from a Connecticut licensed professional engineer um, per the requirements of that section saying uh, there'll be sufficient topsoil even if you took a little bit away basically. Um, C requires the installation of the erosion and sedimentation controls shown on the plans. Uh, D requires a pre-construction meeting. E, um, I worked up in conjunction with the town engineer um, and basically provide for construction traffic to be prohibited from using Cherry Hill Road until measures sufficient to address the safety concerns expressed by the town engineer in the email I just showed you. Um, now these could, I mean, maybe Mr. George, Georgina could um, throw out a couple of things that might be considered by the town engineer might alleviate the concerns he's expressed that might be fairly easy to implement. This would have to be worked out between the applicant's engineer and our town engineer. Um, I did point here that non-safety issues such as the impact of construction traffic on the surface quality of the road would not be covered by this condition. Um, and furthermore, um, if turns out the applicant's gonna propose using Autumn Ridge Road, um, we would need some additional measures proposed and approved to prevent the deposition of mud and any earth material on Autumn Ridge Road itself, like a tracking pad, et cetera. Um, I'm proposing here that there would be a delineation of uh, a route through the property um, that construction traffic might use because they would probably need to take the truck material either up the existing driveway or up the hill through another route and over to Autumn Ridge. So I, I believe it's important that that's, that route's delineated. And if something needs to be placed on that route, like gravel to prevent erosion, et cetera, um, and maintain that route, that that be denoted. And also that there'd be addition of temporary additional erosion sedimentation control measures associated with those construction routes 
in number two here, Roman numeral two. Um, and that that be proposed for the consideration approval of myself as might be advised by the town engineer um, and implementation left the zoning enforcement officers. They may determine it to be necessary. Um, so that's what I'm proposing to sort of handle the comments, concerns of the town engineer regarding Cherry Hill Road's uh, condition for safety concerns about that condition. Do you want to stop here and go through that or you want me to keep going? Yeah, yeah we, we might as well. This is the big <laughs> one. So um, right. uh, going back to the, uh, the engineering memo itself. So the three items, yep. uh, two of, you don't have to go. I'm just, so that everyone knows where, where I'm talking, but um, so there, there's three items here. Um, the last one is a road quality, which is the purview of the town. It's, it's not the purview of the applicant to maintain the or repair already degraded roads that have been neglected. That's, that's not part of this project. That's not part of our purview. The safety matters we do take seriously. Um, one of the main things that we've seen done when there are culverts of questionable um, weight capacity uh, would be the implementation of steel distribution plates. I'm sure you've seen them uh, at many a project throughout Connecticut, uh, large steel plates that are laid down, essentially distributing the force of a truck as it goes over. So instead of having um, a force spike, essentially when you have a triaxle or any type of loaded vehicle, the weight is distributed over the tires based on where the load is. And so by putting down this plate, instead of you having this force that is directly down, when it hits the plate, the plate acts as a distribution. So instead of having force directly over the culvert, it's distributed over a larger section of road. Um, so in the past culverts like this that we've, we've seen, uh, or even when you have a situation where you have to excavate uh, a portion of a road, these plates are used to essentially bridge that gap. Um, so depending on the results of uh, the, the town's investigation on the condition of these culverts, that would be um, a reasonable uh, solution to this problem, unless there's an extenuating circumstance that's uncovered. Um, additionally, in terms of uh, the uh, two-way traffic, exactly as outlined um, by, I'm going to I'm not even going to try John's last name here, uh, but by the town engineer, John, um, the coordination of uh, our uh, site, site management and uh, construction team, would this would be a traffic issue um, for them to either have um, si signalmen posted at loca um, narrow locations to essentially stop a triaxle if one's coming through just to prevent any sort of collision or interaction. Uh, and this is a matter that um, just like closing the lane can be dealt with um, on a in-field uh, basis. It's not a major concern, just needs to be something that's noted and have that note included in the drawing that this is to be assessed and uh, handled appropriately uh, to the satisfaction of town staff. Um, so really that, that addresses the two of these ma major ones in terms of the Cherry Hill safety. Uh, in regards to if there is some sort of extenuating circumstance, um, the reason we have written everything about limiting and working off of Cherry Hill Road is to keep the residents of Autumn Ridge and that subdivision um, happy by essentially keeping all of our construction out of their neighborhood. Um, if there was some sort of major extenuating circumstance that um, took Cherry Hill off the table in terms of use, Obviously, we would have to use Autumn Ridge, and we have every right to use Autumn Ridge uh, for this development. Uh, we have really done our due diligence here to tr to do our best to keep everyone um, happy for the for neighbors and the adjoining subdivisions. Um, but Cherry Hill being um, in a unusable condition is not uh, a situation that should prevent, or um, from a right standpoint to prevent this project because we do have the, the legal basis to use Autumn Ridge. Uh, I agree with uh, the, uh, the situation as proposed um, by Mr. Smith, just that obviously if this becomes a situation, we would need to have uh, a revised construction narrative submitted that I think could be handled administratively um, through Harry's office, just going through what our revised changes are and submit a uh, essentially a site plan revision for uh, our construction uh, entrances and uh, conditions based upon uh, the use of Autumn Ridge instead of Cherry Hill. 
so should I take that that the proposed condition about any use of Autumn Ridge is acceptable? Correct. Yes. Okay. As long as it can be handled administratively and not coming back through the commission, we all understand that the intent of the project here and what this whole mess is, as I understand it, and Harry, if I'm wrong, correct me here, uh, is about based on our construction narrative that we've locked ourselves into Cherry Hill. But if that becomes a uh, infeasible option due to the condition of the road um, that we can administratively handle how to correct that to move forward. Yeah, I and mean, it's proposed um, to be handled by staff. Fantastic. I just want, want to make sure we're all we're all on board with that. Yes. Yep. yep. So proposed for the review approval of town planners, you may be advised by town engineer or any of the appropriate town staff. Um, so you just need to propose plan changes that would address Roman numeral one, two, and three. Um, I take it you're modifying verbally your plan set so that um, Cor correct. So I, I would like to reward that limitation. So unless yeah. only in the event that Cherry Hill Road is can't not be used or something like that. Yeah, I, essentially, I'd like to verbally modify that um, to read along the lines of and the intent of um, Cherry Hill Road is to be used as the exclusive. Um, entrance for this site however in the event that cherry hill road is deemed uh infeasible due to safety concerns autumn ridge shall be utilized and appropriate uh plans and correct a uh, corrective narrative shall be provided to town staff okay um so that's it for me and this is still a public hearing i think um everyone was through all sections of the public hearing, but maybe you ought to clarify that at some point before we deliberate, I guess. Uh, last thing before uh, open up to comments, I just, I do want to report um, that yet we have been, as Harry stated, uh, I have been working with um, Dr. McCarthy, McCarthy uh, from the Forestry Commission. Um, she has provided us a lovely list of uh, uh, species and re recommendations for tree plantings. We are open to two species. That's that's fine. Uh, most likely we'll end up going with um, the maple as proposed, the red maple, and we're leaning towards an oak right now, but I want to just sit down with the applicant and make sure that he picks trees that he's good and happy with for, for that alternative, and we will be um, implementing those in an alternating um, path down the uh, down Cherry Hill Road extension. So essentially, um, instead of having all maples in one section and oaks in the other to, to spread it out. So it's, it's nice and even, even good looking. Um, and then finally, just to update on the uh, neighbors for 14 and 16, um, we have come to a verbal agreement on the, uh, on, on the driveway configuration, which is, um, it, it is, is what's shown on the plans currently uh, that it does conform with that 25 foot setback for number 16, which was the closer uh, driveway to the intersection. Um, and we will be getting um, a signed uh, scope of work statement with them. And we will be putting that on file uh, as part of this application as well. Uh, okay, uh, one last item. I did um, take the plan down to the uh, assessor's office just in terms of the potential street numbers and explain the proposal would start street numbers after 175 basically for the lots created by the subdivision as Cherry Hill extension and uh, they're just reviewing the post street numbers um, in terms of the town's protocol and standards so um, it should be fine but I don't have a final report on that but that's usually handled after an approval anyway all right um I, I guess do you want to continue going through the uh, the remainder of this last correspondence uh, sure. Um, so we were through with all this. Um, so prior to um, any work that would require blasting, um, need to address anything here that just for some reason is not completely addressed. Condition two, um, also including a standard requirement for an offer of pre-blast survey to owners of any, all structures within 150 feet of the um, property boundary um, and limiting blasting from Monday through Friday, nine to five. Um, four would require a number of changes to the plan and other re, um, items to be addressed before the issuance of a zoning permit or a building permit. Um, 
I tweaked some of the language around here. This was the uh, condition about clearing the site um, and basically having um, reports. So I put that somewhere else. So I just took that out. Um, this requires uh, intervals of inspection and compaction testing for the fill that's going to create the slope that's going to hold up the detention basin. Um, the design of that detention basin has been approved by the town engineer and that was specified in the last uh, submitted plans. But this is another requirement the engineer is um, has put on paper and uh, requiring that um, appropriate levels of inspection as recommended by professional engineer, reviewed and approved by the town engineer. Um, five, again, we had one of the other approvals. I think it was um, at least the interior lot ones. And this is a recommendation from the regional water authority again, uh, final erosion control sanitation plans approved by zoning officer, no topsoil removed without um, meeting the requirements of that section. Um, due to the presence of the property in the public water supply watershed, the amount of earth disturbance on the slope, uh, proposing that there be um, basically uh, weekly reports and also additional reports after each measurable precipitation event of a quarter of an inch or greater. This is a recommendation in terms of the, the amount of rainfall and the schedule for reporting uh, from the Illinois Whitelands Agency. They've used this in approvals um, from their side of the fence. Um, I did provide for the waiver of the weekly reports as we did in Summit Place. Um, this is sort of set up for frankly, sort of a worst case scenario of a contractor that's not really paying attention to soil and erosion controls and it sort of puts them on notice. You've got to get them done and you also have to have them done by a qualified person. Um, which I believe I have in here. And then down here, finally, uh, requirements before a CO are issued, um, having certification by a professional engineer that the earth and slope holding the detention basin uh, is stable when a detention basin is full, that the inspection and compaction testing was done as uh, proposed and approved by the town engineer, and that would be a final report certification. The earth and slope was constructed as proposed and approved in the last set of plans and that all the inspections would be done by a professional engineer. A submission of an as-built for all the construction work and site improvements. Um, in the event there was blasting, documentation will offer a post, excuse me, a post-blast survey to owners of all structures within 150 feet of the property boundary that requested a pre-blast survey um, to document any changes that may have occurred due to the blasting. Uh, condition 10, this, um, Limits the use of a rock crusher. Um, right now, none, none have been proposed for use. Um, there are requirements in the zoning regulations to keep a certain distance from the side property lines and uh, show other, and it also leaves the approval of the use of them up to the commission. So this provide for all of that should the applicant want to do something like that. Um, again, 11, um, any measures necessary to control dust lift up to the discretion of the zoning enforcement officer to require and implement. So I think we've got it here. That's all I've got. Yep. Um, Zach uh, Georgina from Giuliano Associates. Uh, other than what we what we hashed out about the uh, Cherry Hill Road and Autumn Ridge situation, we don't have any issues with this. Uh, one point of clarification I would like to make, um, and this is just because I know we had the multiple revisions. We are looking at not the weekly uh, S and E reports would. Uh, qualify for your monthly updates that you had previously requested, correct? I combine those conditions together here. Got it. So right now it's weekly. Uh, the monthly one went away. So we just have weekly and or anything after this precipitation event. Um, and again, if um, ZEO wants to waive that, basically due to no problems being present on the property, then that the zoning office could do that or reinstitute them if necessary. Excellent. Yep, we're we're good with all all of these. Uh, uh, Chuck and Sheriff, is that it, uh, Mr. Georgine? Yeah, I believe so. Uh, the 
as I said from our last uh, last meeting, the the big thing was going through these uh, conditions, and uh, we don't have any objection to any of these conditions other than what was uh, outlined, uh, and mostly it was just uh, uh, addressing them than uh, an objection. Thank thank you. Um, one question about the. Uh, about the Cherry Hill Road Autumn Ridge usage issue, and I think you're, you're certainly, uh, I certainly applaud you, and certainly hope you can use Cherry Hill Road uh, because I can imagine large truckloads of going in and out of Autumn Ridge would be very disruptive, and hopefully you can do that. But, but just a sense of how many truckloads do, do we think we're looking at of exporting fill? Do you? have any estimates i i i don't uh, in all honesty that's i come up with the volume i'm not sure how much fits in a truck or what size trucks the contractor is going to end up using that's outside my realm i'm sorry sure what's the volume uh, about eighteen thousand cubic yards okay um oh. joe uh excuse me average is about 18 20 yards per, per load so it comes out to a thousand loads Okay. Oh. And okay. you're not, you know, then you're going to have the the cement trucks with all the all the when they're doing all the uh, foundation work. Right. Basically, what I see is Cherry Hill needs to be improved to, to the standard of these, so these trucks can uh, use that road, because the way I see it, <clears throat> those numbers that we're just talking about. I think Garden Ridge is going to be a tough place to go, a tougher place than than, than improving uh, Cherry Hill the way it should be improved, so so usage can ma be maintained down there instead of up Autumn, Autumn Ridge. Might be might be wise to work something out with the town to uh, allow at least some some temporary improvements while this construction is going on. Yeah, I don't know if that's what's going to happen, Joe, based on my conversation with the town engineer. Um, you know, just maybe to clarify a little bit, um, my understanding is that um, subdivision approvals can't be um, conditioned upon requirements for improving town roads. I don't think a special exception grading can be either, um, other than the safety concerns. Um, I think it'll be okay. That, that road's been there a long time, even though it's not. Yeah. I think absent the safety concerns with the culvert, I think the town engineer is just going to let it get beat up and then take it from there and, you know, recommend improvements. I think the town will do it. It's just a question of how fast, you know, it's, it's yeah, got to fit in, you know, it's all the competing priorities. So I can't speak to any of that and it's not my purview. So. Okay. Anything major here, you know, like, like uh, Zach said something about steel plates, some, you know, adding some crushed yeah. stone, and, you know, right. just temporary. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I think that kind of minor thing could certainly be worked out, I would imagine, yeah. Yeah, we're not talking something, we're not talking paving or nothing, we're just talking making right. the main road. Yeah, I mean, that's only in the interest, I think, of probably the applicant and the trucks they're going to use and, you know, et cetera. And then, so. it, then you got all the excavator trucks, you know, the all these low beds coming in, bringing in dozers and excavators. I mean, this is all going to be very heavy equipment that's going to be utilized down there for, for a short period, you know, while this construction is going on. Yep. It's going to be all heavy-duty trucks that are be – a lot of heavy-duty trucks going to be needed down there. <laughs> Great. Uh, Chuck Anders, Chair. Thank you, Joe. Uh, good points. Any other questions, comments before we open up to the public? Fred Russo, I'd like to make a comment. Um, uh, listening to all of this information that's been given to us, it seems that the um, the applicant and the, and the property owners in Autumn Ridge, on Autumn Ridge, are both going to suffer because of a, a road that really is not safe to ride on. I don't care if you're in a truck or you're in a car. I drove it today, and that road is narrow. It's got potholes in it. There's two culvers there. I don't know what kind of weight they take. There's no lighting there. And it seems to me that um, it's it's really both the applicant and the and the residents of Autumn Ridge are going to suffer. 
not because they're arguing with one another. I think they've actually been very uh, amiable uh, uh, so far, but because of a road. And, and this road is going to force the applicant to use auto rigs. They, they don't want to. I truly believe they don't want to. And the worst part about it is even if they use Autumn Ridge to temporarily access the property, the way that road is on, on Cherry Hill, people who buy pro buy those homes are also going to use Autumn Ridge. It's a much better, cleaner, safer way to get into that project, to go down that project, even completed with the road that's there, regardless of what temporary measures they make, they're not going to use that road. It's just not a safe road to use. And so I think, and I, Harry, you know better than I, as far as the you have conditions on, you know, what, what roads and, and subdivisions, but uh, the town should really take a very, very hard look at that road for no other reason, whether there was a, a project going in or not, and make the improvements that need to be made there. So it's safe for anybody who travels there. There were other houses around that extension and, and how they, how those residents and populations have not complained, I'm not sure why. But I think that the uh, it's not fair to punish the applicant because the road is bad. I agree, it's not their, in their purview to have to do it. And it's not fair to the people on Autumn Ridge that they're going to have thousands, not a thousand, but thousands of vehicles up and down their street to make the project, uh, to complete the project. And then when it's all said and done, the biggest insult is, I think that those, those new property owners will continually use Autumn Ridge because it's the best and safest way to get to the property. The real solution to this, be fair to the applicant, be fair to automatic people, is the road should be improved. Now, I know that's not, we're not, it's not our business, but I, I just want to let you know that whoever's listening, uh, that's, that I'm in favor of the road being improved. Chuck Candace Chair, thank you, Fred. Any other comments from commission members or staff before we open up to the public? Hearing none, uh, let's open up to the public. Any member of the public wish to comment? I didn't see someone in the chat right that they would like to participate. Um, I believe it was Corey C. They could they could raise their hand. They'd like to speak. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm a resident of Cherry Hill Road. My name is Corey Carangelo. I'm at 159. Um, I just wanted to reiterate Mr. Hofferly's point um, on the condition of the culverts of the road. They are, it, it's in very, very poor condition. It's deteriorating. Um, the roadway is less than 20 feet in front of our house. Um, we actually, our garbage and recycle truck that comes down here is not a full size because they're unable to navigate because they're the road is so narrow. Um, in addition to that, uh, I understand that um, they the, they mentioned having flaggers and having plates installed on the road, but um, I also wanted to mention the slope of the proposed entrance. It just seems not suitable for heavy machinery. The slope is like, it's just seems to be, um, too steep on this side. I think that going through on Autumn Ridge would be better. And I, I understand they also mentioned making the residents of Autumn Ridge happy. I get that. Um, but there are a lot of new residents on Cherry Hill Road as well. So I'm not sure if it would be possible to um, document some of the other residents here that also don't want thousands of vehicles going through and getting, you know, stuck with traffic, unable to be passed um, because the road's not wide enough. Chuck Andrews here. Thank you for your comments. Uh, thank are there? You. Uh, thank you. Are, are there other members of the public who wish to comment? Uh, just to reiterate, down at the bottom of your screen, you have a, a button labeled "Reactions." You can select that, and then gives you an option to raise your hand. Please do this if you'd like to participate. Or you can type it in the chat that you'd like to speak. I do not see anyone at this time. Great. Okay, uh, then I think we can uh, close the public portion of this. And I think we're at a point where we can probably close the public hearing. Is that correct, Harry? Uh, well, well, let's see, does the applicant have any additional comments I'd like to make? Um, I, I do honestly feel uh, for the condition of Cherry Hill Road, but it 
it is not the purview of this project. Much like if someone was to be building a single family house on a road that was in terrible shape or, or a dirt road with a uh, steeper slope, it's not the burden of that property owner to fix the public road. Um, that being said, uh, just to address the comment about the uh, driveway um, or that the drive access onto Cherry Hill itself, the existing driveway is, is rather steep. Um, the proposed supplemental grading plan addressing that um, will actually have that le leveled out a little bit, um, but it's making the best of the existing situation in terms of our access. Uh, the long term, once we finally do all the heavy site work and cutting to prepare the road, it will be a uh, town conforming road. I can't actually remember the, uh, the grade off the top of my head, but it does meet all regulations for uh, vertical curves and uh, uh, slope. So it long term, it'll be a better, better situation in terms of entering into the Cherry Hill site. Uh, Chuck Anders here. Thank you, Mr. Georgina. Do you have anything else? Uh, Mr. G I, I, I believe we're good. I just wanted to uh, address that the uh, the Cherry Hill Road comments themselves. So, yeah. with uh, no other further comments, I'm I'm fine. Okay. Um, the anyone else, commission members or staff, have any comments? Hearing none, then then I think we can close these items as a public hearing. Harry, is that correct? Or we we've got all staff comments as far as am I correct on that? Yes, uh, that's my understanding. Yep. Okay. Okay. So we can close this matter as a public hearing. We we can discuss it. I don't know if we'll actually vote, but we'll at least discuss it a little bit later. I think uh, we'll see where we are. Um, so thank you, Mr. Georgina. Uh, with that, then let's move on to item number five of our agenda, which is Silver Lining Development LLC, 650 Main Street, special exception for a two-family residence. And I understand this is an item that where we, there's also a separate application for the same site um, that's under new business. That's item number three of new business. So I think what we've opened that, we can just uh, reopen and continue it to our next meeting. And we can hear that at the same time we hear that the special ex app, the special exception for the same property for a modification of the parking. Did I get that right, Harry and Evan? Uh, yes, they are requesting a modification of the parking requirements, uh, so they needed an additional special exception. Uh, they submitted that application, and we have them planned to appear on the 30th, like you said, uh, and they also did uh, grant an extension um, to that meeting on the 30th um, okay. for the public okay. hearing. Okay, so they grant an extension so we can continue the public hearing on item number five for the two-family residence special exception to our meeting on the 30th, so we will do that one. So that application is that public hearing is continued to our meeting on the 30th. Brings in item number six, which is S. McDonald's. That one was continued to, uh, that's not even scheduled for this meeting. We continued that one to our meeting on the 30th. And uh, so we won't be considering that one tonight, but uh, we may consider them on the 30th, or if they need more time, it may be continued further. So then uh, that brings us into item number seven which is Brantford Building Supplies. Uh, Chuck, you went mute for some reason. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't know how, how long ago I went mute. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, so we continued item number six, which was McDonald's. And so we moved on to item number seven. Uh, so this is uh, Brantford Building Su Supplies, care of Vincent uh, Giordano, applicant owner, 211 Montaui Street, a special exception to convert the lower level into a residential use. Uh, is the applicant ready to proceed with that? Working on it. Um, I'm having a little technical difficulty with pulling up the plans. I didn't know, Evan, if you might be able to assist me with that. Um, yep, I'm ready for you. Thank you. All right. Can everyone see uh, this plan? Yes. Okay. So um, 
uh, my Bradford Building Supplies owns this property, which is 211 Monoe Street. We acquired it a couple of years ago um, and have um, we improved the first floor and have uh, moved our office spaces into there um, recently and have determined that the best use for the lower floor um, would be uh, an apartment um, dwelling, one uh, studio type apartment unit. Um, so we're proposing to bring that up to code um, for a residence and um, convert it to use as um, an apartment unit, 704 square feet. There's no change to the exterior of the building, no change to the facade. Um, there has there ha has been an egress window installed. Um, that's really the only exterior change and there'll be a few new trees outside. But aside from that, um, there's really um, essentially no change to what you'll see from Main Street or Monterey Street. I'm sorry, I'm not sure what else you want me to, to say here if there are any other questions, but it's pretty straightforward. Sure, thank, thank you, Ms. Giordano. Um, what was, who was occupying that? I, I, um... It was, um, since, um, since we've owned it, it's just been a storage area. And um, to my knowledge, I, I don't really know that it's been occupied for a long time. It was in pretty bad condition. So we were um, planning on making an office space, but just kind of didn't think a lower level office space would be too appealing. Um, so it hasn't been occupied to our knowledge by really anyone. Okay, it's just been stored. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Ms. Giordano. Um, Evan, do you want to review the staff report? Uh, sure. Uh, like Ms. Giordano described for us, uh, they're proposing to convert that basement, basement level unit to a residential one. Um, there is already an existing residential unit on the second floor. Um, so a two family application was required. This requires a special exception. Um, no exterior changes are going to be made, and the applicant requests waiver of the um, survey requirement. Um, they meet the standards of the BR district, uh, as they're not proposing any exterior changes. Um, they did provide a landscaping plan to us. Just pull that up real quick. Um, Given the location of the existing structures, along with the size and shape of the lot, staff has determined that the applicant cannot comply with the strictest application of landscaping requirements and recommend that the commission waive these recommended or waive these requirements uh, per section 6.3L. Um, they satisfy the off-street parking requirements. Uh, no lighting details were provided, but I've added a condition that would require um, compliance with section 6.7. Uh, they appeared before the town center board on March 8th and got uh, a positive recommendation. And based on the application materials, uh, they appear to satisfy the special exception criteria. Um, staff recommends the following findings and conditions. One, that full compliance with section 6.3L is waived per section 6.3L. Sorry, that was compliance with section 6.3. As the commission finds that the overall landscaping plan constitutes excellence in landscaping design. Um, and then one condition that any uh, any changes to the lighting would have to be compliant with section 6.7. Um, and Harry, I believe, do I have to ha add a condition about the waiver of the survey requirement? Um, finding? I think a finding would do it. Yeah, you can just um, say the commission waives whatever that requirement is. Sure. I will type that up. Okay, doke. Any questions, comments before we open up to the public? Uh, hearing none, let's open it up to the public. Any member of the public wish to comment on this item? One more time, any time any member of the public wish to comment? Do you see anyone, uh, Evan or Harry? Nope. Do not see anyone. Okay, then uh We'll close the public portion. Does the applicant have any further comments? No, um, not, not at this time. Just thank you for your time and um, we hope that you'll approve it. <laughs> thank you. Any further comment, questions or comments by commission members or staff? Hearing none then, uh, we'll close this item as a public hearing. And again, this is something I think we can take up in a little bit. Thank you, Ms. Giordano. Okay, thank you. So then that, uh, that concludes our public hearing items. It brings us to our minutes. 
and I believe our March 2nd minutes were sent out to us uh, in the mail. And um, you had a chance to review those. Does someone want to make a motion with respect to the March 2nd minutes? Chadwick will make that motion. Joe Chadwick makes a motion to approve the March uh, 2nd minutes as written. Is there a second? Fred Russo. For the seconds. We'll give that second to Fred. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe Chadwick? Joe Chadwick is in favor. Fred Russo. Fred Russo in favor. Joe Viuso. Viuso in favor. Marcy. Marcy, I think you're, you're muted. Where is she? Oh, we just lost her. Don't see her. No, she got a thumbs up. Did she thumbs up? Oh, yeah. She's, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, for the record, I reflect that uh, Marcy gives it a thumbs up verbally. Apparently, your speaker isn't working, Marcy, but uh, she votes yes. And uh, so those, those minutes are approved. So then that brings us then, what's our next item? Correspondence, anything under correspondence, Harry? Harry, you're- My Harry Smith Town Planner, no, there's no correspondence. Okay, great. That brings us then, let's look back at our uh, public hearing uh, items. Yeah, whatever, just I, when it's fine, just- <laughs> uh, The first, uh, for the public hearings, I the first one is the uh, Cherry Hill subdivision and uh, interior lots and special exceptions. I know, Larry, you've gone through um, draft resolutions and, uh, you know, there's the outstanding issue of we, of Cherry Hill Road. Is, is there any reason, does it, or do, do you think we're ready to vote on this or do you need time to tweak draft resolutions or do we wanna have some discussion before we do that? Harrison, the town planner. I mean, I think I'm comfortable with the recommendation given the box the commission's kind of in. Uh, from a legal viewpoint, I mean, my understanding is you, if the application meets the criteria of the regulations, frankly, they're doing approval. Um, and there's no authority really to get at the condition of Cherry Hill Road that's really left to the town. I mean, some states do have something called impact fees, which if it's a proportional impact by development, then um, the developer could be charged for the cost of you know dealing with that impact. But Connecticut doesn't provide for that, so I've used them in other states, but doesn't it's not allowed in Connecticut. Okay, uh, thanks, Sarah. Yeah, my sense is that I I would hope they could use whatever temporary measures, crush zone, steal something yeah. to make it safe. And then after it's done and the thing's beat up, <laughs> then fix it so that it's really nice so that everyone gets better, but who knows? What, what, I'll open it up. What do you? What do other members of the commission think? Uh, are we ready to vote on this or have any other thoughts? Um, well, I'll just ask. Joe Chadwick, any, any thoughts? Uh, Joe Chadwick speaking. I, I, I don't think we can help anything by further verbally torturing this. Uh, I, I think Harry has like gone through an exhaustive um, analysis of it, and the town engineer has presented the issues. And anything at this point can better be resolved by staff than anything we can do here tonight. Great, thanks, Joe. Fred. Well, uh, as I said earlier, I, I know that the fixing road is not our purview at all. But I do feel for both the applicant and the um, residents of um, of. Uh, Autumn Ridge that they have to put up with this. But uh, if the applicant meets all the criteria, then I'd say we should move on. Okay, thanks, Fred. Joe Vayuzo? Uh, yeah, I'm in, I'm in favor with Joe and Fred. Uh, the applicant has agreed to all the uh, conditions, so I, I guess it's not for us to do it but to vote. Okay, Marcy? Um, I agree that it's not the applicant's responsibility to improve Cherry Hill Road. The town named it as a town road and the town should take care of their roads. And, you know, I think that this is a great way to get the neighbors involved to encourage the town to do just that, whether that's before or after construction. And I think having that, act, that road improved would do a lot to help 
southbound traffic to have another way than having to go on to the 54 exit. So, you know, I think there's larger planning things that were in effect when that was named a town road. So I look forward to it being, you know, brought up to proper standards. And I certainly don't, you know, feel that the applicant should be responsible for that. So, but I do feel that the applicant has gone above and beyond, um, you know, answering our questions and tooling things and all of that. So I, I want to commend him on a good presentation and his patience. So I'm certainly ready to vote. Okay. Check in the chair. Okay. Thank, thank you, Marcy. Okay. And I agree with what everyone said. So Harry, let's uh, pull up the motions and let's uh, go through them. Okay. Harry Smith Town Planner. So in front of you, let's see. And and you already have gone through them. That's the. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to pull them up. So I mean, in case anyone has any questions, I mean, I, Unless anyone wants me to, I'm not going to go through all the, uh, I will edit these in terms of, uh, you know, eliminating the crossed out text and the highlighting and everything else. Right. Just wanted to, everyone to know the changes that were made from what you got last night. Um, so I think everything is as it's on the document here. Okay. So and that's a is... random data today from myself to the commission. Okay. Okay, so, and this is the uh, revised staff memorandum dated March 16th today, 2023, that you reviewed with us during the public hearing um, that sets forth the uh, proposed conditions of approval for the 11 lot resubdivision application number 22-11.2. So with that, does someone want to make a motion to approve this application by uh, by approving the approving the application and um, adopting as conditions the conditions set forth in the staff memorandum that Harry explained to us and is presently displayed in front of us. Fred Russo, so moved. Motion made by Fred. Is there a second? Marcy, I'm seconded. Second by Marcy. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe Chadwick. Joe Chadwick is in favor. Fred Russo. Fred Russo in favor. Joe Vallejo. Vallejo in favor. Marcy Pelosi. Marcy's in favor. And Chair is also in, in favor. So that takes care of that one. Then the next one, I believe, is uh, the what's the second one? It's the uh, the second one is really two pieces. There would be the uh, special exception. Um, for rear interior lot, that's application uh, 22-11.3 for lot five. And there are two conditions, I mean, excuse me, two findings and one, two, three, four, five, six conditions as okay. listed on a memo dated the 10th of March to the commission for myself. Okay, does someone make a motion to approve this application? Again, this is uh, the interior lot number five and adopt as conditions of approval, the condition set forth in uh, Harry's memorandum that's displayed in front of us. So it's the findings and conditions? Yes, the findings and conditions, sir, yes. Thank you. Chadwick will make that motion. Motion made by Joe Chadwick, is there a second? Marcio second it. Second by Marcy. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe Chadwick. Joe Chadwick is in favor. Fred Russo. Fred Russo is in favor. Joe Vallejo. Vallejo in favor. Marcy Pelosi. Marcy's in favor. And chairs also in favor. That brings us then to the other special exception interior lot number two, which is also covered in the same memorandum and it's displayed in front of us. Um, does someone want to make a motion to approve this application by and adopt the findings and conditions in the, the staff memo for lot number two that's uh, displayed in front of us? Fred Russo, I'll make that motion. Motion made by Fred. Is there a second? Marcy, a second. Second by Marcy. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe Chadwick. 
Chair Chadwick is in favor. Judge Russo. Judge Russo in favor. Joe Bayuso. Bayuso in favor. Marcy Pelosi. Marcy's in favor. And Chair is also in favor. And that brings us to the final application, which is the special exception for grading. And Harry, you want to pull that one up for us again? It's also sure. Another memorandum dated the 16th of March today to the commission. Um, and the, there would be several conditions as listed in the memorandum and described tonight. Okay. So does someone uh, want to make a motion to approve this application and adopt as conditions the conditions set forth in Harry's memorandum for this application dated March 16, 2023, the revised staff recommendation? Marcy, I'll make that motion. Marcy makes the motion to approve. Is there a second? Yes. Chadwick seconds. Joe Chadwick seconds. Any further discussion? All in favor? Joe Chadwick? Joe Chadwick is in favor. Chad Russo? Chad Russo in favor. Joe Vayuso? Vayuso in favor. Marcy Pelosi? Marcy is in favor. And Chair is also in favor. Okay, then that brings us then, uh, the other item we consider is the Brantford Building Supplies, Vincent Giordano, uh, 211 Monowee Street, special exception to convert the lower level into a residential use. And um, so I um, want to pull up the staff recommendation for that one. Again, this was a, seems like a, well, let's we'll just so anyone have any comments on this one? There was, it seems like it's a, it's a place on Monoese that been used for storage and they want to use it for residential. Uh, He's pretty uh, cut and dry, Fred Russo. It's pretty cut and dry. Yeah, agreed. So, um, so, um, so we've got the uh, uh, recommendation. Lost you. Checks off. I think you froze. We lost you, Chuck. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. And now, yeah. I'm sorry. My uh, internet is saying I have a week. I don't know what's going on, but um, sorry about that. So, um, does someone make a motion to approve this application by adopting the finding, the two findings, and uh, condition in uh, Evan's staff memorandum presently displayed in front of us? Make motion. Okay, we'll give that to, uh, uh, I think Fred made the motion and we'll give Joe Chadwick the second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Joe Chadwick, are you in favor? Chadwick is in favor. Fred Russo? Fred Russo in favor. Joe Vallejo? Russo in favor. Marcy? Marcy is in favor. And Chair is also in favor. So that application is approved. Okay, let's bring go under to old business. Uh, we have uh, two items of old business. We need to set a public hearing on a zoning map amendment. And I guess we'll do that. Uh, um, we'll, we'll schedule that in accordance. Uh, when Harry will con and I will we'll schedule that one. Harry, any thoughts on that one? Or um, Likely on April 20th. Yeah. Um, see the reason why it wouldn't be on April 20th. Okay. And then item number two is a special exception for House on 30 Brockus Road, and that's scheduled for a public hearing at our next meeting on the 30th. So we'll consider that one on the 30th. It brings us into new business. It looks like there's four items under new business uh, uh, that we need, all of them need to have public hearings scheduled for. Um, any item you want to call out uh, or call to our attention, Harry, of those four items? Um, just to note that 650 Main Street, um, we've already scheduled that for the 30th um, because the applicants, of course, trying to do this as quickly as possible and has agreed to pay the cost of using New Haven Register, the additional cost. Um, it's about 10 times as much as using the sound for the newspaper ad. Um, also, we have... Um, well, I'll talk about that in the plans report. The other three would probably be on the 20th of April. Okay. Well. Great. Okay. That brings, that's it for the new business then. Let's uh, let's go to the uh, planner's report. What's uh, going on here? Um, 
I just note that based on discussion at the last meeting, um, Evan went ahead and finalized um, uh, tentative wording for outdoor dining, uh, new regulations and the zoning regulations. Um, and that has been sent out to um, DEP, which needed a 35 day notice before a public hearing, as well as uh, Southeastern Connecticut Regional Council of Governments. Uh, so we've made both those deadlines to enable a public hearing to be held on April 20th, um, which will be just before uh, state law takes effect on May 1st to give the commission time to adjust, make any adjustments they want in the proposal. I think Evan, you already routed it around to other departments and has got some comments back already. Um, so we'll be sort of coming up with some potential changes for the commission to consider based on all those comments and any other considerations by staff and bring that all to you on the 20th. Great. Thank you, Harry. Anything else for your planner's report, Harry? Uh, not at the moment. Um, at the moment, my mind's a blank. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Other than that. Okay, item number two is a bond establishment for 106 domestic. Yes, uh, we have a memorandum from the zoning enforcement officer um, dated March 8th. Um, states the contract to Warren Construction Company LLC, Vernon Warren, Warner at 106 Damascus Road is requested a bond for the driveway apron. Um, this is from Jane LCO. She recommends that the commission approve the bond in the amount of $500 for the driveway apron. Great. So we'll make a motion to approve the $500 driveway apron bond for 106 Damascus Road. Sure Traffic will make that motion. Go ahead, Joe Vallejo has got it. Okay, Joe Vallejo makes the motion, and then we'll give the second to Joe Chadwick. So the Joes have covered that. Motions. Uh, all those in. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Joe Chadwick. Chadwick is in favor. Fred Russo. Fred Russo in favor. Joe Vallejo. Favor. Marcy. Marcy Just give it a thumbs up. Thumbs up indicated. The thumbs up indicate. That means yes. And chair is also in favor. So I think that is it for our agenda items. Does anyone have anything else? If if not, then uh, does someone want to make a motion to adjourn? Fred Russo makes a motion. We adjourn. Motion made and seconded. <laughs> motion made and seconded. Push some fast seeds come. <laughs> Guys, have a great night. Okay. We're going to vote. <laughs> Are we going to well, vote? Yeah, let's vote. Yeah, okay, let's vote. Um, Joe Chadwick, you in favor of adjourning? Uh, Chadwick and his dog who wants to go out are highly in favor. Okay, Fred. I highly in favor of adjourning. Joe Vayuso. Are you so in favor? Marcy. Marcy, you oh. raise your hand. And, and Massimo, you in favor? I know you were. I sure am. I'm in favor. Okay. And so, so am I. Okay. So I guess we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. This program was brought to you in part through the support of the Town of Brantford. Watch town meetings and other videos on demand at BrantfordTV.org.